So I love the theme of this session on being human, and I was thinking to myself, what is the, the human feeling that I'm feeling right now? And, um, and one word came into my mind, and that word was um, gratitude. And it's gratitude for a lot of reasons, and I think it's the generosity in this room. I have just loved the conversations in the hall, in the, in the luncheons, and in each of the sessions. And what I see in this community is a real fabric, even though we've been together for a short amount of time, but a generosity of listening, a generosity of sharing, a generosity of caring about our world. So I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the projects that's given me more hope about our world and our world's future than anything I've ever worked on. Um, and, you know, as I do this, I've been invited, I love the invitation to dream out loud. So I'm going to share a little bit about a project that's in um, preliminary motion, and it's in a prototyping phase with, with IDEO. And so as I, as I share, it might be a little bit premature, but I feel like I'd like to share this with this community. And it really all started right here at the United Nations. A couple years ago, my specialization in the management school at Case Western Reserve University, my specialization is large group um, planning bringing people together, 500, 1,000, 2,000 people at a time to interactively come to common ground, to interactively discover their shared dreams and strengths, and to come together interactively to take action, so not talking heads or pre-negotiated agreements. And one of the really surprising phone calls was someone from Kofi Annan's office, and he gave a call and said, We'd like you to come to the UN. We're thinking about using Appreciative Inquiry Summit methodology to help in probably the largest meeting in the history of the UN with business leaders coming together to unite the strengths of markets with universal ideals. And it was a thrill. And the story, the background to the story, I think it's a, it gave me a bird's eye view into something that is moving so fast and is so pro positively profound that I think, um, I think it opens up avenues for leadership that are unimaginable for the next 25 years. It started a few years earlier. Kofi Annan was invited to speak at the World Economic Forum at a time where there was tremendous, tremendous anger towards big business. Um, remember the meltdowns at, at Enron and WorldCom and huge debates around business and society beginning to happen. There were so many protests, in fact, at that meeting that they almost held the meeting, almost had to move the location of that World Economic Forum. And so as the protesters were outside, Kofi Annan addressed the group, CEOs from all over the world, and it was interesting because he did not come at it with the same voice. I think in the back of his mind, he was thinking to himself, there is no way we're going to eradicate extreme poverty in the world within the next generation without great new business models and dignified work. There is no way we're going to create peace in cultures and zones that are high conflict without great opportunity and jobs and economic equality. And I don't think there's any way, I think he said in the back of his mind, that we're going to heal the Earth's environment and ecosystems without tremendous entrepreneurship, the kind we saw from Naveen Jain today. And so instead of the chorus of critique, he reached out his hands to the business leaders that day and he said, let us choose today to unite the strengths of markets with the power of universal ideals. And let us choose to reconcile the forces of private entrepreneurship with the needs of the masses and billions who live on less than $2 a day. Let us choose. And with those words, a whole series of top CEOs came up to Kofi Annan and said, we'd like to sit down and begin to articulate some principles and vision for business and society for the 21st century. Great people like Daniel Vesela, the head of Novartis, and Ratan Tata from Tata Industries, and Royal Dutch Shell, and on and on and on, Microsoft. And they crafted these principles, and it was called the UN Global Compact, and they were hoping maybe 50 companies would want to be part of it. Well, there were 50, then there were 100, then there were 200, then there were 1,000, and at that moment, we knew something was up, you know, and that's when we got the call to come and begin to design a new way of doing world summits. And part of it was so exciting, so, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> that we, we couldn't even find a room at the United Nations where you could do that kind of interactive, 
you know? Um, but we said, why bring together all these CEOs if we're not going to tap into their intelligence and build the plan to grow this global compact? So I'm talking about large group planning without, it's not talking heads, not pre-negotiated agreements, but collaborative cap capacity. My sense of hope about what we're capable of. Well, so successful was that within three years, there were now went from 1,000 to over 8,000 of the world's largest corporations. Fast forward to Ban Ki-moon, everybody wondered, is this effort going to continue? Well, not only did it continue, but the momentum amplified and multiplied. And I can't tell you the feelings I felt in this next meeting in Switzerland and Geneva, the next summit that we had with the UN Global Compact, and just as an example, I was sitting at the table and we're telling stories of what's possible in business and society terms. And on the lower left, you see Jeffrey Sachs. Well, you, many of you know Jeffrey Sachs's work, one of the great economists of our times at Columbia University. And Jeffrey Sachs is pounding the table. And he's pulling out the data and he's saying, you know, we can be the first generation in all of human history to completely eradicate extreme grinding poverty, the kind that very few of us in this room can even contemplate or understand. He said, do you get it? Do you get what that means? And he pounded the table. It was almost like John F. Kennedy speaking. And it made me think. And then we went to Jane Nelson, and she was sharing her stories. She's the, at Harvard University, heads up the Center for Corporate Citizenship. And in that group that I was in with her, we were talking about the, the, the solar revolution and the movement of our third industrial revolution off of a fossil fuel economy. And she or someone said, you know, I shared a statistic, you know, if we just covered 10% of the Earth's deserts with solar panels, we could power the whole human family with completely renewable, clean energy. And then she smiled with a twinkle in her eye and said, that's with yesterday's clunky solar technologies. You know? She said, how many of you know Nano Solar? It's a company that the founders of Google have invested in heavily. She said they have a, a proprietary technology where they spray on the solar cells onto something as thin as aluminum foil. And I started to think, what an amazing moment to be a leader and to be in the field of leadership and management and the kinds of things that we're going to see in the next 25 years are unimaginable. Jennifer Deckard, um, a smaller company, Fairmont Minerals, within two years after that meeting, they became ranked the number one corporate citizen in the United States. And then during the session, um, the head of Coca-Cola got so excited and passionate about what he saw happening in the world, he stood up in front of the 1,000 CEOs and said, it is time for all of us to stand up, to step up, and to speak up. And, you know, so that, that night, I have to say, you know, I, I was thrilled, obviously. And as I was falling asleep, we were in Geneva, Switzerland again. Um, I was listening to the BBC news, and I was still tingling from that day's conversations and what I was seeing in this world. And I fell asleep, and I started thinking, well, Tom Brokaw's book, I love his title, called The Greatest Generation. It's a wonderful title. And I started thinking, what are they going to call our generation? Think about that. What are they going to call our generation of the next 30 years? And I thought about it, and I thought, well, they're not going to call us the greatest generation, if for no other reason than that title is already taken. And then I thought, privileged. What a privilege to be a part of this moment, this time, this stage in history, and what we're going to be seeing in the next 30 years in terms of all the potential. So that gave birth to a project that we have at the Fowler Center for Sustainable Value called Business as an Agent of World Benefit. And it's not an assertion, it's a question. What does it look like? Where is it happening? What are the dynamics? How do we speed the spread of those kinds of stories that can amplify and, and expand the world's potential? It's been a thrill. We've done over 3,000 interviews, and I'll just tell you one, just to share one example. By the way, Joseph Campbell, he studied myth, and he studied culture, and he studied transformations, and he had a proposition to share about movement forward in society, and he said, awe is what moves us forward. It's awe. It's being surprised. So I had a surprise in many of these interviews. Um, the, the one that I want to share is I was on my way to Israel to give a talk at um, the Arison School of Business. They were dedicating a new, new building. On my way, 
I stopped in Amman, Jordan. I met with the former prime minister. The tensions in that part of the world were high. Their bombing was going on in Iraq. It was very, very tense. That night, I woke up and I felt feelings again that I'd never felt before when the headlines in the news, very much like our current news, there was a chemical weapon intended to kill 150,000 people. And the headlines talked about how that plot was stopped. I could feel it in a way that I hadn't felt before. So on my way to Israel, I changed the topic of my speech. I'd never talked about this before, but I decided to shift the topic completely. And I started by saying to the group, where's the peace going to come from in this part of the world? Where's the peace going to come from? I don't think it's going to come from our lawyers. I don't think it's going to come from our military. I don't think it's going to come from our paralyzed senates and Knessets. Could it be that business could be the most important force for peace? Well, I didn't have a lot of data. I, again, I just made it up on my plane trip over there. But afterwards, an elderly man at a reception, a wine reception, he came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, David, he said, Professor Cooperwriter, your thesis is right on. He said, your thesis is so right on. He said, he said, listen, can you meet me by my helicopter tomorrow morning at 8 in the morning? And I said, what, you know? He said, my, you know, I, wa I want to show you a miracle of what's happening in Tefan, in the Galilee region. So I met him, and that day was a brilliant day. I'll never forget it. The sun was up high and beautiful, and the Mediterranean sparking, uh, sparkling on this side. And we're um, up in the air in his helicopter, and he starts to tell me more of the story. So we go through the Galilee region, um, all desert, no natural resources, goats on some hills, and so on. And then all of a sudden, you see a beautiful arena, a residential arena, um, art centers, museums, um, schools, and beautiful homes. And at the center of this, at the center of this whole facility, was an entrepreneurial think tank that has given birth to 300 new businesses in the last 10 years now accounts for 10% of Israel's export GNP. Very powerful, very successful. But then the real story, finally, he finally shared with me as we went into the factories, into the schools, into the museums. And it was all based on coexistence and co-ownership. Arab and Jewish co-ownership and coexistence and collaboration with the schools. Arab and Jewish co-ownership of the art centers and so on. And here I am, think about this, in a part of the world where they tell us it's intractable, you know, with the hatred, the bitterness, the conflict, the years of separation, intractable. And here I am, I go into a fourth grade children's class, and they're watching cartoon screens, holding hands, singing, laughing, Arab and Jewish children together. It was really an amazing moment for me, and I started thinking a lot about this idea of business as a force for peace, business as a force for the eradication of extreme poverty, and so on. Um, Steph Wertheimer, this, this thing is not just a story of philanthropy or charity, it's a story of bona fide power of business to bring people together. Um, I asked him, what is your um, vision for all of this stuff, you know? Um, and, and because uh, one of his businesses was just sold to Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett said it was the best run business he's ever seen as it's breaking down these barriers. He said, well, I th I'd like to see uh, for every million persons in the Middle East something like this created and we could completely eradicate the, the seeds of terror and violence and so on. You know how much we spend on military, con or on containment of conflict each year as a world? $9.46 trillion, almost 10% of the world's general product. Why aren't we hearing these kinds of stories? And especially me, I'm a management school professor, gathering stories of business as an agent of world benefit all over the world. Not many of you, how many of you heard that story before? Why not? Why not? They're out there. Um, so we've got thousands of stories emerging, factories that are giving back more energy to their community than they're using. Um, this is an interesting one that I had fun with um, in the Netherlands. And it's a company called, you can Google it, it's called Oat. And they went to their designers, designers, and it shows the power of positive intention and design. Designers, can you design me a gym shoe that young people all over the world are going to love, where we won't need any advertising because of the social media buzz? 
that's completely biodegradable and made from totally renewable source energy um, um, facilities and factories. And by the way, we want something that doesn't do just less harm in the world. We want something that actually regenerates the world. Can you make us such a shoe? Well, look it up. I brought home a whole uh, set of boxes of these to our family. My children are just so pleased, and their friends all want them. But anyway, it's literally shoes that bloom. When you're done with them, you take them out to your backyard, you plant them, they decompose, the f everything needed is right there, and what do you find? An oak tree begins to emerge. Now, <laughs> that is, <laughs> forgive the pun, a seed image of an economy that's possible within our lifetime, economies that bloom. You've probably seen the headlines, Sweden's run out of garbage. Sweden is now importing garbage <laughs> because all of the capacities they have for the regeneration of that and turning waste to wealth is powering 250,000 homes. We can do this everywhere. You know, Google is sending up an internet capacity now that's going to transform the world in another epic way. Everybody in the world is going to have, and especially in developing countries, they're going to have access to internet for free. And Eric Schmidt has promised that everyone will be on the internet by 2020. The capacities that are being born. A recent Harvard Business Review called it Innovation's New Frontier. Another book that is my favorite is called Firms of Endearment. Firms that are winning the hearts and minds of their customers and stakeholders and communities by doing good and doing well. And I just did with my colleague Ron Fry a special issue of the Journal of Corporate Citizenship on the positive psychology of sustainability. Why it is that we're seeing these companies as they help the world flourish, what do you see happening inside their company? the human begins to flourish. I've never seen anything in the field of management that turns on a workplace with pride, with sense of purpose, than people and companies. I think we are facing, as we've heard all day, uh, once in a civilization kinds of opportunities. Imagine this, you know, we can completely eradicate extreme grinding poverty. Jeffrey Sachs, you know, he's got the numbers. Um, for less than $110 in a, in a village, you can jumpstart the whole economy with the Millennium Development Villages concept, kind of like the Grameen Bank, and come back a year later and there's hospitals, schools. The transition of our era is to the transition out of a fossil fuel economy into a renewable energy economy. And the st studies at Stanford show that not only will that not cost us money in the long run, it's going to be open up trillion dollar opportunities. Economies, whole economies that are completely cradle to cradle and literally, like that tennis shoe, help bloom. Education everywhere. And the ideal of positive institutions is within our grasp. Institutions that help elevate, magnify, connect, and combine, and then ultimately refract our highest human strengths, like generosity, out into the world. So brave and good, this, again, this is Steph Wertheimer. He's opening up the next industrial park in Nazareth here. This was last year. My puzzle is why so little news about these kinds of epic innovations, innovations that are epic transition points and movements forward. The field of positive psychology is growing rapidly. You've all heard about that. We have people here in this room that are part of that. Marty Seligman, one of my great colleagues, noticed that the whole human sciences were so deficit-based, you know, that 90% of the journal articles were on what's wrong with the human being. Anger, fear, depression, and so on. We weren't studying things like hope, inspiration, and joy. And what good are those things and those kinds of emotions? Well, today we're studying those things. The appreciative inquiry work that we're doing, this is a book by Barbara Fredrickson that should be on everybody's bookshelf tremendous scientific research on the power of hope, inspiration, joy. And she's made this research, this lab research, accessible to families. What they're finding is that there is a ratio that leads to flourishing, a ratio of probably five to one in the direction of positive hope and emotion versus negative emotion. And then I ask myself, you know, when I look at the news media, what do you think the ratio of positive to self-talk is in our big city papers? 
You know what it is? Cecil Bach did this study. She called it the mayhem index. She was at Harvard. It's 10 to 1 negative. And our studies of human flourishing are showing 10 to 1 positive. So partly what we're wanting to do is reverse this kind of tendency where 80% of our attention is on what's wrong, what's broken, what's hurting, and begin to study um, the opposite, the 80-20 rule. So the project that we're working on right now, um, and I hope that we can include everybody in this room, we're in the prototyping phase with the design firm IDEO. But the question, the design question that we're working is, how might we design a more than Nobel-like prizing for business as an agent of world benefit? Business as a force for peace. Business as a force for eradicating extreme poverty and eco-innovation and imagination and so on. And we need to create the world's finest platform that elevates these human strengths all around the world, that accelerates and connects and combines, that creates what we might call urgent optimism not just blind optimism, but urgent optimism, that spreads these epic, meaning-making kinds of stories. And then my vision is that we circle the planet in a kind of appreciative intelligence, you know, to lift up the best of the best of the best of the best. My last comment, um, I've had the great fortune to facilitate a ma many, many major, major meetings and part of the thrill, one of the great uh, moments for me was when I got a chance to work with His Holiness the Dalai Lama to bring together the world's religious leaders to end religious co conflict in the world, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, and so on. But the later meeting with him, we had meetings at the Carter Center in Jerusalem all over, but the later meeting was with all business leaders. And I was wondering, you know, what that was going to be like, and it was great. We had tremendous CEOs like Bill George, the head of Medtronics, and others. And at the end of that session, I said, but Dalai Lama, you know, I said, I have a question for you. I said, you know, you, you, I, I said, this is an important question of, of leadership. I said, um, did, I don't know if you know it, but the number one major around the world for young students today, undergraduate, is business, for better or worse. It's business. The number one major in masters and graduate levels is business and management. The number one postgraduate training centers is business and management. So I said, Dalai Lama, if anything imaginable were possible, there's no constraints whatsoever, what would be your design of the ideal leadership school, the ideal management school? <laughs> well, first of all, I think it puzzled him, but he's also very humorous, and he, he scratches his head. He says, um, he, he says, well, let me think about that. He said, well, first of all, and I think he was, you know, giving, um, you know, he, he, was, he was saying to the business leaders, this isn't my field, but he says, first of all, I can't manage a thing. And he starts laughing, and he says, if I were asked to manage anything, it would mend, end up in a mess. And then he's giggling, and then he said, and then he went into this profound discourse for about 40 minutes about the need for a radical reorientation, a radical reorientation from our preoccupation of the self to a radical reconsideration of the other, where our life is bound in compassion and consideration and empathy and, 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 and this whole relational kind of view. And then he talked about the role of the positive, and I'll just share the, the comment that he made here on that. He said, you see, positive things do not come by nature only. For positive things, we must make an effort. We must make the effort. Nobody, no one else can do that. So everyone, hope for a better future, a happier future, if that is your wish. So thank you all for letting me dream out loud about a positive revolution in change and business as an agent of world benefit. I think it's an idea worth spreading. Thank you.